So um, I may a couple times through this presentation cover the mic and begin having a coughing fit. I'm a little bit ill. Please don't hold it against me. Um, but today we're going to be talking a little bit about signal processing. Would a sample at any other rate sound as sweet? So we're going to talk a little bit about how our brains interpret sound, scientifically how sound works, and how computers interpret sound. Um, but we'll just start with a bit of an introduction, a bit of saying hello. Um, so I'm Miles. That's a cartoon of me. I really like it. Um, I currently work at a company called Famous Industries, um, heading up the Famous.org project. Um, Famous is a web platform for making beautiful experiences on the web. If you have any questions about it, just grab me afterwards. I'm more than happy to talk about it and answer any questions. Um, believe it or not, but I actually got into programming through making art. Uh, my undergraduate degree was at, in fine art, and my master's degree was in music. I've got a couple of uh, example installations I can show you a little bit. Um, but early on, you know, like when I first got, got started, I actually didn't really know much about programming at all or how anything worked. And I learned about it through trial and error, through building installations, through playing with them, a lot of playing with Arduinos, a lot of playing with Maximus P. Um, this is an example of an installation that I did many years ago called String Theory, um, where I used a laser. I had the laser being controlled by sound. It was shooting into a pool of water. It was reflecting up into a whole bunch of strings. It was a really cool piece. Um, you can see more details about it online on my website. Um, another installation that I did involving sound and space and movement was this installation called the Speaker Bot. Um, this may be loud. We're going to find out. But so this installation worked through a combination of different systems that hidden in the, the back of the room was a connect that was uh, doing skeletal tracking. Inside of the speaker was another computer, um, a BeagleBoard XM, as well as a Wi-Fi router, and they're communicating back and forth. Um, that was a really interesting project. Um, and then this project, which I did more recently in my master's, where I was studying music technology, the voxel meter, um, was a really great way of exploring how rendering systems work, how, um, how sound is visualized, looking at sound that's in the frequency domain and playing with that. Um, you'll actually see a little bit of an update to this later in my presentation. Um, but so let's talk about why I started programming. I started programming because of the device um, that you see right here that's not reacting because I messed with the sound. So let's see if we can get that going really quickly. Turn it on, turn it off and on again. Is it going? All right, cool. So this device is called the Monom. It's a box of buttons. It doesn't really actually do anything. It's not programmed to do anything except for send X and Y coordinates to the computer when you hit a button, and then has an API for sending messages to control the lights. Um, prior to having seen this, I wasn't even into electronic music. I wasn't into programming. Um, I saw this thing, and, and it just blew my mind and got me really into studying, like, how does this work? And how does this work became this rabbit hole um, that just created this whole career for me. Um, the Monom introduced me to a programming language called Max MSP, which is a really, really great way to get started if you are a visual designer, if you're a, an artist, even as a programmer, if you're interested in learning about sound, the tutorials to get you up and running and figure out how to do some basic sound processing and signal processing are really amazing. Um, one of the cool things about Max is it actually has access to its internal API um, through a little language called JavaScript. So you can actually use JavaScript in Max to control pretty much everything from creating um, unit generators, destroying unit generators, connecting them, handling the business logic. So this led me to um, Karma, the Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics, where I learned a lot of the things that I'm about to tell you about today. Some of the core science behind you know, how our brains interpret sound. Um, I already said that. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about how our brains interpret sound and what it means. Um, so we'll start with what's sampling. And you may hear sampling and think about something like this, but this isn't exactly what we're talking about. This is an MPC. It's a classic controller used by many musicians who are making hip hop. You'd usually put a sample on each one of the buttons. You'd hit them. You'd do some really great mashups. You can basically turn the monom into one with a little bit of code. But we're going to take a bit of, of a deeper dive into sampling. And we're going to talk about sampling theory. 
Sampling is the method of converting an analog signal into digital data, and then the act of taking that digital data and turning it back into an analog signal. So you can sample many things, um, but today we're going to particularly talk about sampling sound. We sample sound any time we make a digital recording. Um, unlike analog recording, um, which happens in constant time, digital uh, recording needs to repre be represented in blocks. We need to not think about it as this like kind of ongoing thing. It is discrete representations. It's something in which we are viewing, sampling, recording, and then reading back. You could think about a sample in a way as a pixel for sound. Um, when I started thinking about things that way, it really kind of changed the way I thought about it. It's really cool also to think about you know, like a string of samples as an array in the same way that you would start to think about an image as a matrix. And that really changes the way you start thinking about how you process sounds. Things like a delay line can start becoming an array with just, you know, like a pointer in it. So before we get too deep, I'm going to give you a bit of a primer on some audio slang that you might hear me saying. Um, sample rate. A sample rate is the number of samples per second uh, of sound, and a common sample rate that you'll often see is 44.1 kilohertz. Bit depth is the number of bits used to encode a single sample. A common bit depth is 16 bits. So a codec is an algorithm that's used to encode an audio signal into, uh, into, a digital, into digital data. And a common, a common codec that most people would know of offhand is an MP3. So let's tie this together and look at like a practical example, which is a CD. A CD is encoded in PCM. It's 16 bits per sample and 44,000.1 samples per second. This is kind of the encoding standard of how a CD is made. Um, the algorithm involves encoding each channel of sound into a number between minus 1 and 1. And those numbers are actually um, interle interleaved. So if you think about this like a CD and any, any file on there, a wave PCM, you can think of it as a series of numbers in an array, left sample, right sample, left sample, right sample. And that number between minus one and one is actually a representation of your speaker cone and whether or not it's out or it's in. And so really all you're doing is sending electron, like electrical signals to the speaker for it to vibrate to recreate the vibrations and air that the sound would have originally made. And it's, it's pretty mind-bending when you actually think that like, it really is that simple. So many will refer to like, PCM encoding as a lossless encoding because not a lot of data is lost in the process. Much of the sound is kept. Um, as opposed to something like an MP3, which is lossy, um, MP3 uses a, a number of different psychoacoustic uh, tricks, which I can talk to you later if I have time, to essentially just delete data that you're not going to use. But so there are limitations to sampling. So specifically this. Everyone just take a second, read it. You know, you all got that, right? Um, it's something called the Nyquist limit. It's named after Harold Nyquist. Um, Harold Nyquist's work was built on by Claude Shannon, creating a lot of what we know today as sampling theorem. Yeah, that really helps. Um, but so let's dig into what the Nyquist limit means because when, when you figure it out, it's actually really, really cool. Your sampling rate dictates the maximum frequency that can be represented in a signal. So the Nyquist limit essentially states whatever your sampling rate is, you can only represent a frequency that's half the sampling rate. So if we were to sample a system at 8,000 hertz, we could only represent frequencies up to 4,000 hertz in that system. Everything else ends up aliasing and coming back to the beginning unless you do some sort of filtering to get rid of that noise. So let's go back to a number that I mentioned before, 44.1 kilohertz. It's a standard sampling rate used in audio, but why? It's actually really cool. It's all about the human ear and the brain. Um, humans actually hear to about 20,000 kilohertz. Um, our inner ear is a cochlea. It's kind of shaped like a shell or like a spiral with many, many hairs. And those hairs all vibrate based on sound. And they really only vibrate up to about 20,000 hertz. Um, if you can hear up to 20,000 hertz, you're doing pretty well. So if you think about it based on the Nyquist limit, 44.1 is actually, it's a compression. 
by sampling a 44.1, we know that we'll have everything up to about 20,000 hertz, which is pretty much what anyone's going to ever actually hear, the psychoacoustics of it. So we can throw anything else out. We could record 96,000 samples if we wanted, but we'd be recording twice as much data. But, you know, why would you want to sample higher? So 96 kilohertz actually allows you to avoid a bunch of aliasing, as I was mentioning before. Any sample that, above, that ends up above that limit ends up back at the beginning. So if you're in a studio and you're recording an album and you're recording, let's say, drums, and you're hitting cymbals, which have a lot of really high frequencies, if you're recording at 44.1, a lot of those high frequencies are going to wrap around and end up muddying up your low end. Whereas you can record at 96 kilohertz, apply a filter on the high end, then resample down to 44.1 when you go into production on a CD, and you have, sorry, it's about to happen. <coughs> sorry. <coughs> but so yeah, so when you, when you bounce down to production, you're able to have like way, way less um, noise in your low end. And you know, when you only have like one thing that you record, you won't really notice it. But just like any system, as you start introducing lots of different things into the system, that noise starts adding up and it starts muddying up the sound. So when you mix up your guitar and your bass and your drums and everything, eventually you just really can't hear what's going on in the low end because it's muddied up with all these aliased sounds. So why would you record at a lower sample rate and what would that sound like? Um, telephones, for example, are traditionally sampled at 8,000 hertz. Again, compression. Humans' voices are around the 4,000 hertz range, so we don't need to encode much more data than that. And it's really easy to send more, wire, more data on, along the wire when we're only dealing with 8,000 hertz. So let's do a first demo. So here we've got a program called Adobe Edition, and we can see the representation in the time domain of the sample up here, and the representation in the frequency domain and this is a sound that was recorded at 44.1. It's taken from a TV show. You may recognize it. So if we go and we take a look at this version of the sample that's been resampled to 8,000 hertz, we can immediately see in the frequency domain a whole bunch of data has been lost and changed. And what's going to be really cool, you may not really pick it up over this mic setup, but it's going to actually sound like it's coming over a telephone now. Believe it or not, George, if you're at home, please leave a message at the beep. I must be out or I pick up the phone. Where could I? <laughs> I'm not home. So one of the things that's really interesting about that is that we can go and take pretty much anything that you record, resample it to 8,000 hertz, and all of a sudden it has this kind of like principle where it just sounds like it's on a telephone line. And that's just your brain messing with you because everything you've ever heard at 8,000 hertz has been you know, through a telephone. So you have these kind of like psychoacoustic things that are working um, all the time. Your brain is playing tricks on you. But so let's go back to the human ear and let's talk about a few things about why music works. And this starts getting really cool. So as I mentioned, you know, the exponential response of the hairs in the ears, all the different hairs in your ears like vibrate at different frequencies. But the frequencies that they vibrate are not just randomly dispersed. If you take a look at the diagram here, you can see that they actually disperse out in an exponential pattern. What's really cool is that exponential pattern actually becomes linear when we talk about experiencing pitch. So up here on the top, we can see A4. That's the fourth A on a standard keyboard. A4 is traditionally 440 hertz. In the Western music canon, that is the note that all other notes are tuned off of. So What's really cool is A5, the following A, is 880 hertz. It's exactly double. So what's neat is you could literally take any arbitrary random frequency, multiply it by two, and you'll experience pitch being doubled. For me, this becomes really cool because there's very few phenomena that you can have, like kind of an empirical measurement tied up with this kind of like psychoacoustic or just kind of like feeling. Like you feel what a tone is. 
And the fact that what you feel is linear compared to the exponential growth is really crazy. And all of our music is built off of these patterns. Like, yeah, as frequency grows exponentially, we experience pitch linearly. Pretty mind-boggling. Um, this was originally discovered by Pythagoras, which is really, really cool. Pythagoras discovered what we now know as the Western musical canon. The chromatic scale was discovered by Pythagoras. The diatonic scale, that was discovered by Pythagoras. The circle of fifths, that was discovered by Pythagoras. The greatest musical achievement in the modern era. Well, that was actually Fish's set two rotation jam, Deer Creek, August 10th, 1997. Um, but I, I'm just like a dirty, no good Fish fan. Um, but what's really cool is that musical notes as we know them today, um, and actually like all the musical notes that we know are false and were lied to, and if you want to know some of that musical history, just grab me. But these notes have existed longer as a means of communication than the English language. It's crazy. It's crazy. You listen to music and like you feel something and like humans have been communicating that way for like a really, really, really long time. Um, so I got one more demo for you um, before we go. Um, last night I stayed up and I built a little uh, vol a spectrometer um, using Famous and WebGL. And so, very similar to what's going on here. And I want to just take a second to describe what's going on here, how this works. The code's available online. You can take a look at it afterwards to kind of see how this works. Um, but what's going on is we have my microphone feed, which is um, being read using the Web Audio API. It's being fed into an analyzer node. That analyzer node is applying an FFT. The fast Fourier transform is a transform that can take something from the time domain and move it to the frequency domain. So if we think about two arrays, and one array is representing the time domain, that's like what we were talking about before in PCM encoding. So each sample in that array is the amplitude of the sound at that particular time. What, an, what something in the frequency domain and what the FFT gives you is a block that represents the amount of energy that's in one partic particular frequency bin at any particular time. And the number of bins that you get is relative to the number of sam the sample size that you take. So to simplify that, right here what we're seeing is 16 bins. So if we took a sample of 32 samples in the time domain and put that through an FFT, what we're going to get are 16 values in the frequency domain about how, mu how much energy is in that particular bin. So all we're seeing here is a visualization over time of overlapping windows of this frequency domain being summed up and essentially just driving a column. Um, I can dig into the code afterwards. I'll have my computer with me. The code is all online on GitHub if you have any questions. But you know what's really cool is you can also think of each one of these bins as one of the hairs in your ears vibrating and how much it's vibrating. And all these things kind of add up. There's lots of little things in these systems. Um, and I find it pretty amazing. I think for right now, that's about all that I've got um, as far as talking about audio, talking about sampling. Um, thank you so much for finding the time. If you have any questions at all, please grab me. I have a lot of literature I can put you towards, a lot of example code. Um, but thank you so much for the time. And again, thank you, Dave and the team from Ford for putting on this amazing conference. <laughs>